the, the camera is facing uh, class right now, right? Where do you do? You see? Okay, okay. Yep. It, it's it's not bad. It's it's good. Uh, but <laughs> there's uh, only I only see three people in attendance. Yes, yeah, so you, you have a record attendance today. <laughs> <laughs> It's a ch champion day. Maybe, maybe I should just uh, give credit to those who show up in class. <laughs> oh. Nice. I was the first one logged in. Okay. 75% of credit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I do have some printouts uh, for everyone, like 11 copies, but I'm, I'm not sure if... Oh. Probably will be a few people more. I see some motions through the door. Good. Hey guys, you're breaking statistics. I thought it will be a <laughs> record attendance of the uh, fewest number of people, but with you, probably not. There's one, one more. Uh, no, I, there's one more. Uh, I no. saw the camera from the last time we had Thursday. Apparently a couple of years ago in the physics department, no one showed up to computational physics one day. Uh-huh. And it turned out to be the professor's birthday that day. <gasps> oh, um... Oh, my. Um, I do not have feedback, but I think the camera shows on the uh, big screen. Do you see it, uh, everything where you need to adjust left, right, or zoom in, zoom out? I just see the where you're standing in front of the screen. Do you see the rest of the uh, the, the screen itself? Yep. Oh, okay. I, very good. Very good. Okay. We are, I think we are, we are ready to to start. So, um, I think you are always uh, bored during the weekend and you do not know what to do, right? <laughs> So you, you are suffering without uh, hope. <laughs> At least it, it, it is my uh, little perception. Um. So I'll, I'll, I'll send the copies uh, through the email as well. Thank you. And, and this time uh, there are no uh, detailed step-by-step -step instructions, but if you vote and suggest that you need them, I will be happy to write one. And probably I will, I will complete the homework myself uh, to develop a grading, uh, grading thing. When would the homework be due? Tuesday. So uh, the question number one will be uh, to fill uh, a chart. And if you will be sitting and listening what I'm mumbling today, it will be sufficient to uh, fill this chart. But do not submit it today. Keep it even if you feel it right now, keep it until Tuesday. And uh, you guys have broken the statistics. I thought it would be under visited <laughs> class. You sound disappointed. Yeah, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> it's just to cheer up your weekend. And uh, here. I'm showing my respect to copyrights uh, of the published books. <laughs> so, uh, if you do not trust to the mumbling of instructor, you can compare it with the, what is written. And um, basically, I will go over half page of this uh, printout with, uh, with details. Not the first half page, not the half page that is with big text but uh, somewhere in, in between. Okay. Um, we're slight advancer. Uh, 
connected. Slide dispenser. Slide dispenser doesn't, it does work, okay. So we are here on the uh, first Hohenberg uh, Cohen theorem. And uh, before we, we started a new chapter, this functional theory, um, right before the uh, break, we went over observable periodic solids Hohenberg theorem. And last time, we went through um, Thomas Fermi theory, which is um, like historical ancient analog of, of DFT for a crazy universe that doesn't have uh, ions, only electrons, and these electrons do not attract to each other. And uh, right now, we need to go through uh, two theorems, one per lecture. Um, it is not needed. You can slip this lecture and next one. Uh, the, mm, th th this <coughs> subject was important in like late 60s, beginning 70s, 80s. Uh, when there was a, a, a lot of skeptical perception of density functional theory. People didn't believe that it is uh, real, that it can... Uh, so it's strange that it gives correct results often. And um, uh, people designed theorems that prove that DFT should give correct results. The main confusion was that there is a uh, wave function is not needed to get right observables. And it, it sounds very strange, because all quantum mechanics is based on wave function. And uh, I'm going to go over theorems that are part of the community knowledge, yes? Do you mean that you don't need the full wave function to get sufficiently accurate results, or that it's... Uh, if you are not looking into ground state, if you're looking on the... Uh, if you're not looking to excite, if you're looking on ground state, all observables can be extracted from the density. Like exact, or...? Exact. If, if you know right function, there is a theorem that right, correct, absolutely correct function does exist, but it is our problem that we do not know it. <laughs> but mathematically, it, uh, it's, it's, it's there somewhere. Yes, yes, correct. But this idea that right now no one starts tearing uh, hairs away, um, no one tries to throw uh, tomatoes in me because we are in 21st century. If uh, I would declare it in like 70s, probably the, it would be very emotional reaction. So we will go over two theorems and the most, on, on my opinion, the most important lecture of the whole course will be next week Thursday, Kohn-Sham algorithm. So it is the like cream of the cream. It is not complicated, it's really easy to, uh, to percept, but if you are aware of it, you are like independent researcher ready to, to do jumping. Will we also uh, show the Kamshan orbitals? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, you, you can catch me in line or formally contradictory <laughs> things. Uh, density functional theory is formulated. Theorems are formulated without wave functions, but and there are exotic people who do orbital free DFT without any wave function. But just for matter of comfort, there is a little admixture of um, orbitals into the procedure that we know as quantum orbitals. <laughs> but formally, they are not needed. One can do everything without them. Okay. Um, it's too early for us as a group. It's just from previous year, but uh, one day you will select uh, subjects for presentations. And uh, later you will select subjects for the project. So this is the homework. Um, few boxes uh, of the flow chart that I distributed. The compute uh, s absorption spectrum for this perovskite cluster. It should be easy. Just repeat what we did in the lab. And then it, it gets more and more complicated. Uh, compute absorption spectrum for the last thing we did in lab, for the uh, periodic nanowire of titanium dioxide. And do not hesitate to come contact me. I will answer any questions and try to walk in and uh, give some uh, suggestions. Then uh, next, so up to here, I think everyone will do more or less comfortably. Then it gets more 
complicated. So prepare a three-dimensional uh, structure of uh, not cluster but bulk of the uh, perovskite. And uh, it will be too challenging to design everything from scratch. I will provide some input coordinates to start with. But your task will be to select this adjustments parameters when you create a uh, postcard. And surely uh, make density of states and absorption spectrum. And uh, for those who um, will still feel bored after this, one can do the same steps for uh, let Telluride. OK? Um, I'll skim through very quickly because we, we went through this um, recall uh, before. So uh, we recently finished uh, Hartley Fox theory, right? And there were um, kinetic energies of electrons attraction to ions uh, direct Coulomb uh, and uh, stabilizing exchange. Here is the flow chart for Hartley Fock procedure that later on we will develop the same, not the same, but very similar flow chart for the um, density functional theory. So it, all theories target the same thing, the uh, total energy and uh, several observables. Um, I have invited you to sleep during the lecture. If you literally followed my recommendation, you may develop um, a little confusion between too many flowcharts. So there is a flowchart for the homework, which is just a logical stream for a proof of a theory. And there will be later a flowchart for how the algorithm works. The, 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 there are two different flowcharts. Just do not mix them. Okay. And uh, recently we covered uh, observables. When we were doing it in this room before the break, it was kind of not quite necessary, but now after you, st you are starting to compute absorption spectrum, it, it makes more sense, right? So the oscillating electric and uh, magnetic field are the light, right? And uh, through dipole approximations, they affect molecules and uh, materials. So the energy of photons is absorbed by promoting electrons from occupied to unoccupied objects, right? And here is the dipole, which is just positive minus negative times uh, di uh, distance. And uh, there was an observation that uh, formally the dipole interaction between the light and matter should be processed as matrix element of overall dipole in the brain cat of Slater determinant, which is a disaster. And we were proving that uh, it can be waived, it can be avoided uh, through... Uh, so we didn't do formal proof, but we went through um, multi-electronic um, Hartree products on the left and right for ground and excited. We took the dipole operator and we, f we followed the Brian Kett procedure. And as a result, carefully uh, looking through this thing, we found that expression for matrix element in multi electron basis can be uh, reduced to matrix element in basis of one electron orbitals. So it is to some sort of an approximation, but very good and appetizing approximation. So what you are, uh, you, we all are, are doing in the lab is, is that um, ability of a molecule or material to absorb light, which means promoting from ground state to excited state, which uh, wants to jump from orbital I to orbital J, right, can be uh, correlated with matrix element of transition dipole between orbitals i and j, right? It is uh, what we are doing. So orbital i, orbital j, matrix element of position operator. And here are the little warnings. What, what is what? When you will be doing 
um, research projects and written reports, it will be very relevant to put a question like this in your reports. Just giving a heads up. Periodic solids. Um, remember what we did uh, last thing before you, uh, when, we, when we all were tired, last thing before you departed from the lab. We took a little unit cell of the stadium dioxide and then assumed that there are replicas and there is a little offset of uh, distance between them, right? So it's standard thing for pre uh, periodic materials and then there is a block tier theorem for a special uh, type of uh, wave function. Okay. And you all remember Koopman's theorem that uh, ionization and affinity are tightly related to energies of orbitals. Okay, we just studied density function of theory, where instead of wave function that gives you total energy and all observables, one can play with only density, density of all electrons, which is very appetizing because it is uh, wave function has uh, as many independent variables as many electrons times three, right? And density has just uh, three independent variables. So it's like many, many orders of magnitude cheaper procedure. Uh, and uh, we went through the Thomas Fermi theory, right? We split all space onto uh, boxes and decided to express total energy of the universe as function of density, which is number of particles per box divided by volume of the box. And through uh, little exercise and recalling of your favorite equation from basic quantum theory, particle in the box, right? We went to we went to we went to I probably just approach and click the, the yes, it's much quicker. Um, I still forgot, and I do have a movie uh, for this density of states, but now Gage and uh, Ben are both here, they remember this movie. If you don't believe me, ask them. So how the shape of um, uh, periodic or st structure, not periodic, uh, of nanostructure affects the density of states. Remember, uh, there was a lab and movie in the basic uh, quantum theory, you can, right? Thanks, Cal. Okay, thank you for the, for the support. And we use uh, this occupation and density of states to find momentum. And here is the main result of the Thomas Fermi theory: that the energy, total energy of the universe, that consists of many electrons, not direct electrons, with uh, density defined in each point of space, is just a three-dimensional integral of the density to the uh, power five thirds of this density, right? And uh, it falls into definition of a functional, function of a function. So if we do no density, we can find total energy. And this is symbolized by a rectangular bracket. Okay, five third. Um, very soon you will see that so-called LDA, local density approximation, uh, will use four thirds, which is relatively close. So it's, it is uh, not far from this, the, the simplest uh, um, version of DFT. So functional is conversion of a function into a number. Example is when you I have forgotten my pedagogical trick. I needed to erase it and invite one by one someone to, to write these equations on the board. Imagine that you are coming and writing it, okay? <laughs> so uh, if you're integrating wave function square, you get one for one electron. If you have n electrons, you get uh, integrate density for, for each, and then you get n for number of electrons, right? Uh, so. And if you get uh, total density into the power of five thirds, you you get uh, total energy if uh, there are no ions, and you, you give Thomas and Fermi. So L 
stands for function of a function. Okay, so a little of definition and for today and next Tuesday we are going to speak about a little philosophical things that are they're not practical and they are a little orthogonal to intuitive thinking. So just just prepare if you're not sleeping, which you're welcome to do. <laughs> Uh, so just be prepared that there will be some counterintuitive things that uh, are not immediate, not, not nature on the first glance. So when we all love and practice quantum mechanics, we already develop a mindset as like string, a pathway, a logical sequence. First we define Hamiltonian operator, operator of energy, then we diagonalize it, and then we find energies or observables after we're getting wave functions. So straight procedure. Hamiltonian is first, wave functions are second, energy is third. And at the point number four, we may or may not find probability density or charge density, right? So it goes at the very bottom of the food chain the density. It's like not, not the top. One thing. Another thing. Uh, what is included into Hamiltonian? If we refer back to the very beginning of the course. Of course we have things related to nucleus and we have things related to electrons. So we focus only on electrons. We do have uh, kinetic energy of electrons. We do have attraction of electrons to nucleus and we have electron-electron repulsion. So first and third kinetic energy of electrons and repulsion do exist even in case our universe is missing ions, right? So imagine crazy dream of a physicist uh, opposite to, to chemist, like there is a universe where there are no molecules, there are no ions, only electrons everywhere. Right? So then in the Hamiltonian we are missing the, the second term. No attraction to, to uh, nucleus. But fortunately or unfortunately, we are living in a world with molecules, where electrons are getting trapped by uh, positively charged ions, right? So what determines property of a molecule? When you are doing practical um, computational chemistry work to do homework or to you do your project or hypothetically to find descriptors for your uh, cheminformatic models. You're building atomistic models, which means you're setting up Cartesian pro uh, projections of each ion. And then you set up type of ion, right? Type of ion with number of with charge or whatever, right? So your input the only input you do when you do practical work is setting up positions of ions. The rest is inside your code. You do not change it. Right? So the only thing that is foreign, outside, external to a molecule from the point of view of a computational chemistry theory is position of ions. Or if you speak more philosophically, potential, attractive potentials that ions exert on electrons. You see? So if you... Um, Based on their position. Hmm? You said the ions interacting with electrons based on their position. Each ion yep. is positively charging and therefore it attracts negatively charged electrons. Yep. And uh, ion creates, uh, creates a Coulomb attractive field potential around. Each ion creates a Coulombic field. Another ion create another Coulombic field. And if you add them together, it will be potential exerted by all ions to electrons. Right? So you are setting up positions of ions, but poor electrons feel overall potential of all ions together. And therefore they see, oh, in this area there are so many ions, they are so attractive, let me go there. Right? So here is a little counterintuitive thing. 
V with uh, nucleate with electron attraction, summation of Coulombic terms, is external. So the only thing this external is counter <coughs> So it is external potential. And external it is in the sense that for electrons, like we all brother electrons, who is against all of these external ions? It's a, a little uh, counterintuitive. So you're saying the ions are the external portion of the of, of the Hamiltonian yes. of the of the of the world of electrons. Like uh, if if you have Thomas Fermi model, where like all electrons are living together, and suddenly something external comes, like ions. Okay. So the V and E is our external part, and so our kinetic and our potential. That's going to be kinetic. Uh, energy of electrons and uh, so it's kind of the and, internal and, and kind of? Uh, kinetic energy of electrons and electron electron repulsion are internal. But okay, okay, okay. Now, now we're now we're making sense. Okay. Attraction to ions. So our lowercase is position of electron. Our uppercase is position of ion. So basically, you're just describing what's happening inside your system and outside your system in the Hamiltonian. Well, it's all together. All together. I, all together. I, I, okay. I warned you that it will be counterintuitive. It's all, all one thing, but we just okay. philosophically split them onto, onto parts. Okay. And this term, I'm, uh, I apologize for spending too much time, but it will be important for the theorem that we are going uh, through right now. Uh, so, let's play Wheel of Fortune. Um, there is a word stupid, but it is like not very academic. Let's find polite way to say that an idea is ridiculous or stupid, a noun, and you already have first and last. Can I just say it? Absurd. Uh, yes. Oh, well, uh, the million Shoot. dollars go, go, goes to Ben. <laughs> oh. You got it? So here is uh, Thesaurus uh, synonyms, the absurd. Um, originally, well, Ben um, studied Latin, to my knowledge, and originally this word is Latin. So uh, absurd means, you see, nonsense. So Okay, <laughs> um, I had a helper who, who did it for me and told that everyone in the audience will like it. So, hmm. here is, is the thing, the theorem, that we are, there is, if you are comfortable with this, you can either fall asleep or just lift and, and uh, depart. We are going just to provide proofs for this little line. But it is very strange. Uh, s some years ago, uh, um, community was strongly against it. And there are some echoes of this uh, rejection of idea even, even these days. So if you tell, uh, I'm doing ab initio computation, specifically DFT, some people may start throwing tomatoes at you, telling like, DFT is not ab initio. I'm just telling uh, different opinions. Um, so, the first theorem of Kohn, or Kohnberg, Kohn tells that if you do know the density of your electrons, and it is all philosophical, it's not procedure how to compute. It doesn't tell, uh, like, suppose that you have completed some computation, or you have data set, and the knowledge of density determines external potential and determines total energy. So the basic idea of DFT, so that if you know, you, and you see, there is no wave function here completely. So if you know the uh, spatial distribution of all electrons, it's much cheaper than wave function, then you can reproduce which ions were staying at which place. 
you can reproduce external potential. And then and, and, and you can find uh, total energy and basically all observables. So knowledge of density determines ev all knowledge about the system. This is quite uh, challenging and, and um, uh, inducing resistance in, in, in community. And this statement can be proved rigorously. And if you do not like what I'm talking, there is uh, like chapters in the book that cover it. Um, so I have a question. So this please. is this is uh, more or less when you say have a bulk system, and no, you're no, attaching any, any any system. I'm just giving an example. So say you have a bulk system and you add some ligands. Are you more or less just kind of doing a surface calculation without wait, going wait, deep wait, into wait, wait, wait. this uh, theorems did appear a lot ahead of time before any computational codes. So people would prove the theorems before one was able to prove in, in practice. Mm. Okay. Uh, but if you want a practical example, um, I think we were plotting orbitals and uh, ESP potentials, right? But we were not plotting total, total charge density, which was possible in uh, with Gaussian, and we will do it for sure with uh, our new new chapter. So, if you did a calculation, mm -hmm. create a charge density distribution for all electrons, plot it, and then erase everything else on your computer, then this information about charge density distribution is sufficient to recognize and reproduce which ion at which position mm -hmm. was originally placed. I see. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And. Um, the proof of this theorem will be based on the mathematical trick. Ben, which trick? Why did we look for this? And absurdum. Um, so we will start. We will uh, assume that this statement is wrong. And then we will do some simple logical steps, which will bring us to a nonsense. Is that a proof by contradiction? Proof by contradiction, yes. Good. It's a different uh, terminology in each uh, language. Uh, and it, it doesn't coincide in uh, each one I, I practiced. So, ad absurdum is uh, original Latin, and uh, in modern languages it's uh, so contradiction. In, the, uh, uh, in um, Russian it's like from adverse or from idiotic. <laughs> okay. So, if you would object this theorem even before before proof and tell I do not believe it. How uh, density, density can determine positions and, and uh, of ions at external potential? Well, not as a proof, but as just to make you more happy with your uh, mind. We know that typically direction is opposite, right? So the positions of ions is a logical source, and density is consequence. I'm okay with this. So, in forensics, what's a typical way if, like, there was a crime? What uh, What is the most typical way to recognize who was doing a crime? If there Take the like, fingerprints. Yes. So, a, a criminal is a source, and density is a fingerprint. So, by looking at a fingerprint, you can recognize who was uh, present here. So, density is a fingerprint of a molecule. Okay? Density, external potential. Good? So, we are going to feel... Well, I'll, I'll try my best. And... Uh, then you do the same either now during weekend and then I'll check uh, 
maybe you will do better than that. So we will start from um, wrong, from one wrong thing, one good thing. We'll do some operations, and then we'll go to uh, ridiculous contradiction. And the um, we will assume that so. Let me repeat once again how the theorem is formulated. Uh, the density determines total energy, absolute value of total energy, which is one and only one. This is formulation of theorem. And our wrong assumption that should lead us to a ridiculous contradiction is that there is more than one total energy coming out from one density, which means like there are two criminals who uh, leave the same fingerprints, okay? And through some uh, mathematical steps, logical steps, we will prove that no, it will be ridiculous. Fingerprints are unique, even in quantum world. So, in, on one side, we will assume that from one ground state density, we have two branches, two different external potentials, and uh, two different total energies, like two branches. Here, we will use uh, knowledge, another theorem that we discussed before, the theorem that is behind uh, Hartree-Fock theory, the variation of theory that uh, we all are assumed to know in the middle of the night if we woke up. Uh, which means that variational principle is uh, outside of, of DLT world. It, it, it exists on, on its own. And it tells that if you have Hamiltonian, you have uh, ground state wave function, then you have one and only one um, ground state energy, and any change into wave function in respect to this uh, ground state wave function will be will provide bigger matrix element of any other than ground state wave function. Will provide energy bigger than ground state energy. So any change in wave function will provide increase in energy if your wave function is not a ground state wave function. So we take it as a piece of knowledge that we are relying on. Add something to wave function. So we will combine formation, hypothetical formation of two branches of external potentials and variational theorem. So we will blend them together and um, I could keep a long intrigue until the end of the hour, but uh, we all are adults. So here, what we were, here is the nonsense that we, we will arrive at. So energy, total energy of branch A plus total energy of branch B will be less than total energy of branch B plus total energy of branch A. So two equal things, and one will be less than another. If, uh, if, if this hypothetical statement was discovered. So why is it nonsense? We'll get to that. One plus two is smaller than two plus one. <laughs> is it uh, normal or it is a little nonsense? Well, um, um, for regular people, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I have my food and I don't care who is bigger than what. Right? But uh, if it is uh, um, someone who is dedicated with mathematical rigor, it, it's like against mm. the rules. So it's, it's nonsense. Mm. It should be equal, not smaller. Right. So here, here is the mm. uh, okay. I see. Contra contradiction. Absurd. <laughs> and therefore, since it, it, this one is absurd, we will tell, it's a little hidden here, that um, one density gives only one external potential and one total energy. One and only one. 
Yes. So, in that top left box, you have the density going, and then that's an arrow to the right for. Um, I was repeating. It is a redundant repetition of the same statement. It's just. Yeah, it's same rule. There is no logic behind it. I was just re repeating it several times and make it works. And then to the right of that one, that wrong assumption, is that a consequence of someone assuming that a density can't be due to the coordinates? So yes, let's assume that one density can lead to two different external potentials, or two, okay. that the same, density, same ground state density can be generated by, by two different molecules. Okay. <laughs> Same thing, just with a little non-hand typing. So if we are do, uh, living in the... Oh, excuse me, I have a better slide. So let's consider these two branches. First, branch A. This branch A has external potential, V sub A, Hamiltonian, V sub A, because as soon as we find external potential, we can reconstruct the Hamiltonian, right? Because everything else is trivial. And then um, the, if we put here I need an empty slide and pr probably write, write from scratch. There is nothing wrong here, but uh, uh, a live writing is, is, is better. So we do have uh, branch A, density A, uh, external potential A, Hamiltonian H sub A, and ground state, uh, ground state wave function sub A, and total energy E sub A, right? So in this branch, in this branch, uh, we do have that E sub A equals Psi A H A Psi A. Right? So there is there is no uh, intrigue. We just follow standard things in, in, in a branch. Now what if we borrow and, and in the branch B Branch B, there will be row, row. Oh, no, 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 it's same, same row, same row in, in both branches. Same row, but it, it gives uh, V sub B, H sub B, Psi sub B, E total sub B. So now we are going to borrow the wave function, which is assumed to be ground state wave function for branch B, and we plug it into, into this expression for branch A. So we put psi sub B here and there. And we can, since uh, we assumed that external potentials are different, then Hamiltonians are different, and this wave functions are different, right? and uh, total, uh, total energy is a different. So we can write down that Psi sub B is Psi sub A plus some 
Delta Psi, right? And if we plug in this variation of the wave function into variational theorem, then uh, Psi A plus Delta Psi H A Psi a plus delta psi. How would it relate to um, ground state energy of the of the branch A? Like here, when it is its own ground state wave function, it is equal. But if we increase the wave function, what will be the sign here? Can we still put equal sign? Which, what, should it be bigger or smaller? Okay. So wh what is bigger, energy or matrix element? Matrix element. Correct. Matrix. Yes, matrix element is bigger. <coughs> okay? And um, we can interchangeably write the same expression, like swap the indices and write the same thing uh, for branch B. But the idea that we follow two branches and then borrow wave function from one branch to another one. Okay? Um, object right now or stay mute forever. <sighs> okay. Now, prepare for one more mathematical trick. Um, I apologize that I do not write everything by finger from, from the beginning. It would be probably better for uh, discussion, but if there are already slides, I do not feel comfortable discarding them. So, we had Hamiltonian A for branch A. We have our wave function for branch B, and we have this uh, bigger side bigger sign, right? Or energy is less than the matrix element. Now, mathematically, we are not forbidden to add and sub subtract the same thing, either number or vector or operator. So if it is operators, we minus HB plus HB, right? It's completely legitimate. We are not violating anything. Now let's process this difference of these two Hamiltonians and this uh, HB part separately. So, on this right side, first term in the right side of inequality, we have matrix element of the subtraction of Hamiltonian for branch A and branch B in the Bryant cat of the wave function of branch B. And uh, at the second term on the uh, right side of inequality, we add together the matrix element of Hamiltonian of branch B in the ground state wave functions of branch B, which will be actually, by our definitions in, at the beginning of the theorem, will be ground state energy of branch B, right? Total energy. Again, think once again, develop any objections if you can, because it is almost, uh, it is the last step when we are thinking, when we are doing creative thinking. Uh, the rest of the proof is just mechanical uh, following of the, of the like, very, very simple operations. So you didn't catch me or you didn't uh, catch with original authors of theorem on anything wrong at this step, okay? You didn't, you didn't. Okay. So what I'm going to do, uh, again, no intrigue, plain open card. Rewrite this expression by swapping A to B and B to A everywhere. Like if you started from opposite branch. And then adding together these two uh, inequalities and see what happens.
So just same thing as we did before with little uh, better writing. And a little observation. So each of these Hamiltonians for branch A and branch B is composed as, as, as always from kinetic energy of uh, electrons, uh, electron electron repulsion, and external potential. This is correct for both branch A and branch B. And kinetic energy of electrons is the same in both branches. Electron electron repulsion is the same in both branches. The only difference in these Hamiltonians are external potentials. Okay? So if we subtract these two Hamiltonians, the result will be just subtraction of these two external potentials. Good? Like adding each uh, column, H sub A minus H sub B, it's just uh, difference of external potential A and external potential B. So the expression that we started from is changed to the form where we have total energy of branch B, total energy of branch A, and here matrix element of the difference of the external potential of the, of the branches as a matrix element of total energy of branch B. A little think that seems, I would say it is natural, but uh, if you were literally following my suggestions and sleeping, right now there is a good moment to wake up for a couple of seconds. So it will be not intellectually changing, but it will be something useful for the future and for writing methodology sections for your uh, written reports and for speaking speaking the language of DFT. So I'm going to go from red line to black line and uh, um, share enthusiasm that they are equivalent. So if we are finding expectation value of an operator, especially if it is not differential operator, but just diagonal operator, like uh, um, Coulombic attraction, which has only, only a diagonal term, then expectation value is, <coughs> instead of Brian Cat, you can do integration. Wave function star, wave function without star, and the thing that we need to average, right? Good? Standard thing. But now, wave function star times wave function without star is nothing but density. If you fall in traditional interpretation of quantum mechanics, probability density, and if you are a big supporter of density function theory, it's charge density. Okay? So, this matrix element formulated on a language of like, canonical quantum mechanics can be with, without any tricks. It's completely smooth and rigorous transition. can be reformulated on, uh, on a language of integral of density times uh, the thing that we need to average. Okay. No one objects. No one found it strange. It seems natural for you. Okay? Give me a sign if, if it is strange, but... Are we... I mean, it. it's interesting. I mean, the the red part where you have the wave functions and then it's the just the one... Um, whatever that's called, of sub B, uh -huh, right? The wave, uh -huh. the wave function. So... I guess I'm a little lost, maybe, on that part, well, or maybe not. <laughs> there, um, we are 
expressing, mathematical expression, the same thing. Those mm -hmm. two are equivalent. But they are kind of same thing expressed in different languages. This is the language of wave functions, and this is the language of densities. So okay. if we do okay. know densities, we can find observables as well. Okay, by got it. Okay. Appropriate integration. If you uh, accepted this little change in the notation, Then, our forget about this uh, red thing. I just uh, was uh, lazy. Instead of uh, writing two lines, I, I, I wrote one. But originally, um, I am converting this black line in everything black written here. So, energy, total energy of branch A is smaller than this matrix element. Which is not according to our previous slide. It is density uh, b sub b, which is just wave function b uh, squared times difference of external potential a minus b. So this line is the same as this line plus total energy of branch b. Okay. And no one for, forbids us to swap A to B or B to A uh, consistently. If I would be more uh, workaholic, I would make just a second line. So, what is good and what is bad in this expression? It is good that we are speaking on the language of uh, density. We do not have wave functions anymore. We removed wave function from the consideration. It is good that we do not have any kinetic energy of electron and electron, electron repulsion. And the bad thing that we are putting index rho sub b and rho sub a. No, no, no. We start. We agreed that we have only one density. And uh, whatever we have wave function, uh, psi sub b or psi sub a, uh, after uh, making uh, absolute value squared, we should arrive to the same density. This, this is not discussed. It was our original assumption. So we should remove the index a or b and put just density here. OK? And the rest of indices will stay. So there will be uh, two inequalities. Okay, one day I, I remember I had a little energy to do something. So, we do not, so we do not, we do not need index here. So it is one branch, total energy of branch A, <coughs> density of external potentials, overall density, less than, or Kurt taught me carrot, or it is carrot back, is it same, also carrot, or how do you call it? Like if it is bigger, it is carrot, if it is smaller, less than greater than something? Huh? Less than greater than? Okay. So energy less than matrix element, and here for another branch, uh, branch B, total energy is smaller than uh, matrix element of external potential differences is absolute total density here plus energy of branch A. And it is what, what I've just told. There is there are no different uh, densities in, in branches. Density is the same for both branches. <coughs> so now we do need just to add together these two lines. Uh, if you are energetic and enthusiastic, you can do it before I walk to the keyboard and uh, flip to the next slide. So, when we add together uh, left side of inequality, we will get E sub A plus E sub B. Right? When you add together right side of inequality, you on the right most, you will have E sub B plus E sub A. And here, the density is the same here, V sub A minus V sub A, V sub B minus V sub B. So they will cross uh, cancel. 
this one will cancel this one, this one will cancel this one, right? And you get E sub A plus E sub B smaller than E sub B plus E sub A, right? Which uh, for rigorously thinking mathematician is absurd and uh, ridiculous contradiction, which means that something at our original statements was wrong. Either variation of theorem was wrong, or assumption that one density can generate two different branches was wrong. Since we all are believing so much in variation of theorem, we are coming to conclusion that different branches is wrong. Okay. So our original statement that same charge density leads to alternative branches of uh, absorbables, no, it brings it to absurd, therefore we uh, cross out And we start, um, since no one was objecting, we, um, through democratic procedure, no objection, it is assumed correct. That Density determines external potential and total energy and all observables. First theorem of Kohn. He did two theorems and one algorithm and got Nobel Prize for it. So you are 30% away from Nobel Prize by now. Quantum charge density determines only one branch of observables. And here is your flow chart that you may feel uh, to populate uh, the, your time when you are bored during the weekend. So in our straight logic, the set of nuclei and their position determine chemical properties. And there is no doubt. But Logically, um, just in, in um, space of ideas, the electron density is a fingerprint that can reproduce ionic potential. And uh, this idea that a fingerprint allows to reconstruct ionic potential um, will be needed for the second, for the second theorem. Uh, and la later on, uh, it will allow to um, um, set up algorithm and do all calculations so much quicker than anything, anything else. So the second theorem will tell that uh, there is um, only th that correct functional does exist, and there is only one correct functional that allows. To, reproduce, to find total energy if you know uh, density. Find energy if you know density. Done? I'll stay here to answer any questions, but there are, there are no more materials. Uh, please uh, feel free to send multiple emails regarding homeworks. Do not uh, waste time. If, if it, uh, I wouldn't say that the homework is super quick, but uh, if you ask questions at the right time, you request help, either from me or from each other, it will be so much quicker. Do not, uh, do not sit and hit, hit the wall if something doesn't work. It's so much quicker through collective uh, intelligence of, of the whole group. Um, okay? Awesome. Very good. Have a nice uh, weekend. I hope it will be not boring. No, no. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.